Good morning, everybody. Hello. Good morning. Let's just open up in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this day. Thank you that you are with us now, that you love us and you care for us. You want good things for us, Lord, and I just um, ask that to be a realisation for each one of us today, Lord. Ask a blessing on each one that's here, that we will enjoy each other's company. That's easy to do, but we will realise your presence with us too, Lord. And thank you that you are, in your precious and loving name. Amen. In a very Baptist way, say Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Right. Just like that. Oh, happy New Year. <laughs> happy New Year. Well, it's the first Sunday of the New Year, so welcome to the New Year, 2021. Is that right? 3rd of January. A year of Mad Max. A year of Mad Max. Absolutely. <laughs> Movie Max. <laughs> Join with me as we just open our, our first, um, open with our first song. Your name is great. 
Lord, this morning we choose to rejoice and bless your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity we have to come together as part of your family, as your children together. May the words of our mouth, the meditation of our heart this morning be pleasant in your sight. Amen. Please be seated. You remember Alan and Alicia, who usually sit down the front down here. We've been supporting them for close on 12 months. Um, supported them on their mission trips, um, helped fund their repairs to their motorhome while they're on f mission trips. Um, over the last five months, we've been supporting them in prayer um, in their pregnancy with Elijah. This week, Elijah lost his battle with, for life. Um, his little heart stopped beating. So over the last couple of days, um, Alicia had to go into labour to deliver Elijah, not alive. So we'll remember them in prayer. It's a tough time for them. It's a tough time for us as a church family. So let's pray. Father, with this news, we have a range of emotions. Grief profoundly and sorrow, but also confusion and, and bewilderment and misunderstanding of, of your plan for us as, as your people. So, Lord, this morning we lift up Al and Alicia to you. We thank you that Elijah is alive with you forevermore in glory. But, Lord, we pray for ourselves as we process inf this information, as we come to terms with our own emotions. And, Lord, help us to recognise your faithfulness in all situations, whether they're distressing to us, whether they're joyful to us. Lord, help us to trust your plan for our lives. Lord, we lift this prayer to you this morning. Amen. We've got a number of the church family also in recovery for, uh, from different things. We still remember Andy. Um, Luke's having a change of medication, so he's a bit fragile at the moment. Phyllis has been having asthma and been in and out of hospital a bit. Um, Lillian's recovering from surgery. Um, they're the ones that immediately spring to my mind. Um, you're probably aware of others too that we need to be praying for. So let's spend a little bit of time in quiet prayer, lifting to the Lord those that we know are in need. Lord, you are the one true living God. And we remember these names, we remember these people, and we lift them up to you. Not with a vain hope that somehow things will be better for them, but fully trusting that you have a plan for their life, and that plan is good. Lord, we pray for those who are ill at the moment. We pray for those who are struggling, whether it be financial or relationship issues or emotional issues. And grief and loss, Lord. Lord, we lift ourselves to you by putting ourselves at the foot of the cross. Recognising that you gave your one and only son so that whoever believes in him shall have eternal life. Lord, we thank you for that promise. We lift these prayers to you in your name. Amen. I've become aware of this morning of a young lady who's got two kids, um, aged about three or four, who's needing some accommodation. She's come to our awareness through the autism support group. So if you're aware of some possible accommodation, have a catch up with Denise. She knows some more details. Thanks. Judy. Good morning everyone. Welcome everyone and any visitors to our church today. I was going to mention that little bit that, but I won't do it now. So I lost that bit. That's all right. I'm okay. All right. Birthdays this week. 
Happy birthday, Gwen, for tomorrow. And guess what? That's it for me today. Bye. <laughs> It was. Do we need this any? No. Wow. <laughs> Sorry. So, <laughs> Reese is speaking on Philippians 3, 13 to 14. So for the first time in my life, I've actually read what the pastor's going to talk about. Oh, hey. <laughs> <I'm winning. laughs> and it's tried to year. work that into a worship time. I didn't have much luck, but, but what it did bring to mind, and I'll, I'll read out to you, and I'm actually going the verse before, 12 to 14, um, and uh, who's actually saying this? Paul. Paul. Paul says, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I am pursuing, but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the purpose that Jesus Christ has called me to fulfil and wants me to discover. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all the past. I forget all of the past. I fasten my heart to the future instead. I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. And I was thinking about Old, New, Old Testament and New Testament and I, I tried to incorporate a psalm into this because like Celia I love the psalms but I couldn't find one that quite, quite got what I want, wanted to, um, to say but I did in, in my view the Old Testament is, is us searching for God um, please correct me if I'm wrong but the New Testament is him searching for us in the form of Jesus and, and this verse came to mind in Hebrews 10, 17 to 18. And he adds, who, who does Hebrews? No one knows. Sure it's an unknown, isn't it? Yeah. So somebody says. <laughs> then he... It's, well, it could be a poet. Okay, we'll go with him. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Now, when I thought about that, I thought, well, that doesn't mean a lot when I first look at it. But if you were a Jew in the early days and you didn't have to sacrifice whatever you were sacrificing to be forgiven, that would be massive. So bring it into our situation. We don't have to do anything to be forgiven. Do you agree with that? We have to repent, but that's after. So in effect... He has forgiven, regardless of who you are or what you've done or where you're at, the forgiveness is out there. Is that right? Yes. It's available to us. So it's for us to accept, yes? yes? We don't have to do anything as far as being forgiven. It's already on the plate. That, stick with me. That's got to be good, eh? And it's just, it's just a thought after, I, after that I had. Wonderful, what, a, what a wonderful God we have. His giving of himself in the form of his son, his love, his promise, his gifts, his patience and forbearing. Who doesn't need patience and forbearing? Okay? In, in what we, where we are and what we do and, and how we are as human, we need, to be, have, we need someone to have patience with us. And God has that in abundance. So just that thought and just a prayer I have for you and I wish I'd stop saying just. <laughs> but Heavenly Father, we come together today to praise and worship you. We thank you for the forgiveness you have blessed each one of us with, a forgiveness that is there for the taking regardless of our past. Refresh our understanding on this fact. The gift of your grace and mercy is something we do not understand but are forever grateful for. So we stand before you knowing we are loved and accepted. And we ask today, Lord, that you open our hearts to a fresh understanding of yourself. In that vein, we're, just going, to, we're going to sing a couple of songs to him 
who is everything to us, regardless of what we're going through. So just sit and, and, and soak him up, praise him and worship him. Think of those things that are hard to deal with, like, um, well, we all know. And somehow God can work a miracle into all of that.
really appreciate these guys and everyone who's kept the things rolling through through the Christmas season and um, just, uh, yeah, thank you, thank you. I've just had a message from Al and uh, he's asking if we can support 
I mean, prayer right now. Um, I think the, the toll on Alicia has been massive, as we can imagine. The, the emotional strain. And he's asked us if we can pray specifically for her in her health. So let's just spend a few minutes doing that as we... Father, there are some things that we experience in life that are just too hard. That strip us of words. And as your people, we pray that you might, by and of your spirit, take our unutterable groans, the words we cannot find. Holy Spirit, that you take these words and turn them into prayers of intercession for Alicia right now in the name of Jesus. Amen. You see, when Romans 8.26 talks about the, the unutterable groans, the Greek construct is stenagmos alalatois. It is as far removed from glossolalia as the east is from the west. So the groaning of spirit is not speaking in tongues. These are groans that cannot be found. You cannot form words around these groans. But the confidence I have are those groans of heart in those moments where we can't even go, "Ah!" we can't even utter a word. This is an unutterable groan of spirit of heart. The confidence I have in the person of the Holy Spirit is that he takes those moments and turns them into prayer on our behalf to stand in the gap and intercede. So thank you for sharing that moment. Thank you. I... I, since I've been at Maryborough, I've been amazed at how our ministry has rolled out and, and the, the, the way things have kind of spoken life and God's heart into our life. And looking, and I, I left this up today because I think it's really important for us that, that we put Christ into the center of all that is happening. That we have a certainty and a confidence, the C. Do you remember what the H is? Hope, the hope of prayer. Your prayer has been heard. The R, redemption. The I, the inversion, the inspirational inversion where God favours the lowly and the the rich and powerful go A, empty. The S, from silence to song, the surprise. The T, the fullness of time. I've just been amazed at how God has spoken his heart to us. Very nearly going to bail out of this morning. I rang Tony at about 7.30 and I said, mate, you know, this, this news that we're all adjusting to in this moment takes us some time to, and I, I confess I am a bit close to it. And uh, I will be going up to see Alan and Alicia and Elijah this afternoon. would value your prayer for that time as we begin to plan a farewell for this little man. And, um, but as I talked it through with Tony and I said, look, I'm ready to go. I've I've got a ministry around, around this idea and I'm just not sure, you know, should we bail out of the ministry and just spend time praying and, and as we talked it through and kicked it around and, uh, because I just don't want to plow on when people are facing frightfully difficult circumstance and situation. But as we talked it through, just maybe there is something in this morning to both acknowledge what, is, what we are corporately experiencing, but give us some encouragement that despite circumstance or even perhaps because of it, we, we find the resources to press on. So... Good morning and welcome <laughs> to the first Sunday of 2021. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, it was in 1582 when Pope Gregory the 13th, they love their numbers, he called for a review of the Gregorian calendar because of a 14-day discrepancy, 1582. And that was when there was the introduction of the leap year. Fascinating. 
In the process, he then ordered the restoration of January 1 as the marker for the earth about to recommence or commence another revolution around the sun at the beginning of a new year. And anniversaries like that provide opportunity to review the fast, as review the fast, <laughs> review the past. As, as Socrates said, uh, an unreflected experience is a lost experience. And so I think on anniversaries of moments to, to reflect and to remember, I think is a healthy process of, of the journey of growth and development. But then we don't stay in that place, but considering what's happening in the present and then to have a go at setting some goals for the future. Now, some call it a New Year's resolution. I don't know how many of you have made any of those, but given only about 8% of people are still on track with their resolutions in February, right? Let's not call it that. Right? Let's call it New Year's transformation because for some of us, the past year may well be a year that we prefer to forget. For, for many of us, hardship has invaded life. Some have said farewell to someone really loved. And then there's sickness and infirmity. For some, there's a fresh realization of our mortality, the fragile hold that we have on health and mental stability and health. And that's before we even mention COVID and everything that it's brought to us around that. So many of us have had, had our Christmas plans and year plans just absolutely messed with because of COVID and the shutdown over the new year. I know for, for us, we have. We've just had a, an endless procession of people that were meant to be heading south have sort of cycled in through our revolving door. <laughs> yeah. So, the challenges. There are disappointments, some that we cause ourselves where we may not have given circumstance or situation the attention that they deserve. And then there's challenges caused by those around us. It might be a family crisis or relational challenges, maybe a difficult neighbor or trouble at work, moving to a new house. I mean, these are all things that mount up that we experience. But let's not forget the high points as well that have resulted in elation and celebration. You know, nearly every day, someone shares a story with me about the wonder of God's involvement in their lives. A God who works in beautiful, amazing, mysterious, and often confounding ways. But whatever our varied experience each one of us have had another year pass this week. So it's good to reflect and remember and take stock of our resources and set some attainable goals for the new year while it's still new. Because the scriptures often speak of events that impact our lives and how we're able to overcome the euphoria of the good things and the successes, but also the crushing desolation of the bad things, to realize they're just different things that we ascribe good and bad to. But they're different things so that we can get on with living and achieving the things that God has for us to do. You see, Paul had a life full of events that shaped his understanding and the way he lived. There were joys of seeing people trust Jesus, seeing embryonic small congregations of disciples begin to emerge, to grow and to multiply throughout the known world. Growing infant believers into mature disciples to continue on the work. In this passage we're particularly bringing into focus from Philippians today, Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem. He's been detained for two years in Caesarea. And then he was sent to Rome as a Roman citizen for trial before the emperor. So Paul is actually writing this from a prison cell. So have that in the back of your mind when you hear what he has to say. Let's have a go. So this is what Paul says around his circumstances. He says, whatever were gains to me... 
because prior to this, he'd outlined his pedigree as a Pharisee, as a Jew, all of his, what he had done to gain his right standing before God. And he says, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. How much is all, by the way? The whole bang what? All. I consider them garbage. Actually, the, the Greek word is a lot more graphic than that. It's uh, goat manure is the Greek word. Very graphic. So he considers them garbage that he may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, which he claimed before, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. This is what Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. And that's about where a lot of preaching stops, doesn't it? We, we like the good stuff, don't we? But it goes on. And participation in his sufferings. Becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained all this, as Phil read a moment ago from the Passion Translation. Or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And as Phil's translation, it was running towards, and we'll unpack that a little further as we go. Running towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So Paul writes this one thing I do, forgetting what is behind straining towards what is ahead. I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So even after four years of his freedom being denied from him, Paul is still setting goals, pressing into that which is in front of him. And I think that's remarkably transformational. So the, Paul, the word that Paul uses here, straining for what is ahead, is how the NIV puts it. it it's, a, it's a wonderful Greek word. Uh, I'm going to have a crack at it. Here we go. Epic. So, so it's epic. Epic tenonymous. There you go. Epic tenonymous is the word. And it's the word that describes a runner going flat out. Usain Bolt. Sub 10 second, 100 meters, every fiber of his being leaping out of the blocks and striding, striding towards that tape, straining everything, every muscle, every panting breath is harnessed towards that goal. In fact, I'm not even sure Hussein Bolt would take a breath. He may do. That'd be a good question for him one day. But everything. The picture is one of an Olympic foot race and in such a race you're not concerned with past territory. Looking back can be disastrous but you're pressing on towards the finish line. And Paul says forget what is behind. But what are the things that he wants to forget? Well, to forget what is behind the first cab off the rank is around the, the disabilities, difficulties, and discouragement. 2 Corinthians 12 and 7, Paul says that he has a thorn in the flesh. There's, there's something that reminds him of his mortality and keeps him grounded. He actually says that the thorn in the flesh keeps him humble to keep him from becoming too proud. 
he, he would call, and, and the Bible doesn't talk about what that thorn in the flesh is, whether it's a quirky bit about his personality, possibly, or it might be a physical ailment, a, you know, a line to when he met Jesus face to face and the scales that covered his eyes that, that fell away. Some would suggest it might, might have been that. Don't really quite know what that thorn in the flesh was, but it was something that he, he obviously had prayed about and prayed about and prayed about to be renewed, removed, and it never happened. But then there's the difficulties and discouragements. Have a look at this list that Paul drops in from 2 Corinthians 11, 23 to 29. He says, in, comparing, in talking and addressing to the false accusations from false apostles, he says, I've worked much harder been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, been exposed to death again and again. Check this out. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. That's eight floggings. Once I was pelted with stones. That's nine. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. Good grief. Have a listen to this. I've labored and toiled and often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I've been cold and naked besides everything else. I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Wow. That uh, doesn't, definitely doesn't describe the prosperity high life, does it? Doesn't describe that at all. It says, this is... This is this is my badge of honour for being an apostle for Jesus. If, if my Jesus was mistried and crucified, why do I think they're going to treat me any differently? Why do I think it's going to be any better? You know, certainly not beer and Skittles. But you know, if Paul were writing today, I wonder if he might refer to the no parking signs everywhere in shopping centres and else places saying something like, you'll get fined at best or towed away at worst if you park where you shouldn't. I wonder if, if Paul is kind of drawing our attention to, to our propensity to park by the difficult things that we experience and define our lives through that lens. And I think Paul is saying, no, don't look over your shoulder, don't park by those things, be defined by Jesus, pursue these things despite circumstance. You see, one of the greatest dangers in life, I think, is parking. It's not getting knocked down, it's actually staying down. Parking, resting, settling, getting comfortable. No one ever parks in life without paying a price. Life is always a road to somewhere unless you're kind of on the road on Christmas Day heading back to Brisbane and between Caboolture, uh, between Caloundra and Caboolture, it's a car park. <laughs> boy, oh boy, wasn't it on Friday last week when Jackie and I headed up. Oh, good grief, I thought it was never going to give way. Oh, terrible. But life is a road to somewhere and life is evidenced by growth, by movement, by development, by struggle, by progress, by going somewhere so you don't park. It doesn't mean you don't remember those things that have gone on in the past. It means you don't park by them and define yourself by them. You keep driving, keep pressing on. You don't park, even by our disability. Everyone is, any of us have got a disability of some sort or another. We're all out there somewhere. I mean, how often do you say to yourself, what's the use of going on with my challenges? What's the point of going on with my history, with my past, with my hassles? 
with my personality? What's the point in going on with my family, with my infirmity? What, what's the point of going on with these things I don't like about myself? You know, we've all got something to deal with of one sort or another. Paul called it a thorn in the flesh. There's, we've all got something that irks us about ourselves. And if you don't know what that is, think about what you project and transfer into somebody else because the things we pick up about others are usually the things we don't like about ourselves because the trouble is, you see, when you start pointing, you might have one finger going out, but you've got three coming straight back. All right? So the things we don't like about others, we need to stop and check and take a breath and think, hang on a minute, I'm actually speaking more about myself than I am the other. It's worth thinking through. You know, we've all, we've all got things that irk us about ourselves and some of us have found clever ways to cover them up. But others of us have learned to turn adversity and challenge into the stuff of growth and excelling. You know, the, when life throws at us a brick, we catch it and put it under our feet so that we can stand one rung taller and it throws another brick at us and we catch it and we put it under our feet and we catch it and we put And we might feel like we're in a hole and all that's coming at us is bricks, but that's our salvation because every time a brick comes, you catch it, put it under your feet, you stand that much taller and eventually you drag yourself out of that hole because of the goodness of God who empowers us to do that. You see, this is what I've learned. If the irksome thing about ourselves is submitted to God, it will be transformed because if not, it will be transferred. Give one person a challenge, they may well carry on and complain. Give another that same challenge and you have, well, you might remember the world's greatest showman. This is me, P.T. Barnum. And I excuse the language, I don't like the language, but it was the language of the day, with his freak show. They were people. And they were people in community who found that they were better together than they ever were on their own. (laughs) What a blessing for us. We are better together than we are on our own. And that together we discover untapped sources of power, unknown abilities, unused energies that are far more sufficient with God's help to compensate for any disability or difficulty, any opposition, if only we refuse to park by those difficulties and we're prepared to break new ground disability is simply a term that means differently abled that's all and we're all differently abled to each other it's as simple as that adversity hardship and challenge one of life's greatest teachers we either become bitter or better in the midst of hardship challenge and difficulty. This is where God does a deep work within us and a deep soul is born. So that's the difficulties, discouragements. And then we've got failures, forgetting what is behind. The failures of, of life. He mentioned his failures. Philippians 3 6, he mentioned his biggest failure of all, his persecution of the church, his comments around his misplaced zeal in Galatians. 1 and 13 and 1 Corinthians 15 and 9, where he he was an active agent to cause difficulty for followers of the way. What an irony. (laughs) Kind of, since Paul's Damascus Road moment, he's building up what he once set out to destroy. I mean, who among us has never failed? Who? Person who has never failed has never attempted anything. And that's the truth. Each one of us has said, oops, at some point, haven't we? 
The thing is, when I say oops, I know why I've said oops. When you say oops, I say, why did you say oops? What was your oops? What was it? Help me understand. Because when I say oops, I know what I've oopsed on. How tempting is it to try and rationalize our failures? If only I was lucky like so-and-so, or if such and such hadn't happened, things would be different now. And then we park by them, saying things like, what's the use? Last time this happened, well, it'll happen again, sure as eggs. I can't be bothered. How often do we do that? And I think the scripture is calling us beyond that. You see, as I said earlier, life's greatest tragedy is not to fall down, it's to stay down. The greatest disaster in life, it's not to fail, it's to park up and say, what's the use? What's the old saying? It's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. Isn't that what's spoken? I think that's a pretty fair cop. It takes a lot of courage to love. And there's a lot of pain involved in it too. But you know, the, the, the country and Western and two types of music that I don't like, one is country, the other is Western, you'll get over it. But the country and Western singer Garth Brooks once said in an interview, don't die with your music still in you. you know, too many people pass from life to death with their song unsung. But Paul says, forget what is behind. If you want to succeed, you've got to be prepared to fail. But it's not just about failures, it's also about successes. Paul had to move beyond his attainments and his successes. Early in chapter 3, Paul lists his Jewish pedigree and privileges, almost as if he's counting them off, one by one by one. And his Jewish attainments. But when he met with the risen Jesus on the face to face on the Damascus road, it all proved like goat dung, worthless, in fact, less than worthless, absolutely on the bugle, worthless. Earning merit with God through keeping law, Paul now regards as leading only to failure and despair. Salvation is something that's received and not earned. Mind you, Paul's not knocking such success per se. He's simply stating that a wrongly motivated success orientation leads to all kinds of immobilization. And we get, become filled with our own important our own important status, our own importance. Parking by our past successes can be far more dangerous than wallowing in our failures, but the result is the same. But in this regard, a competitive success orientation produces proud winners and sad losers who feel in no bodies. And that's got to be wrong, doesn't it? Doesn't it have to be wrong? We, we, we judge our worth and our value on the basis of our performance? Isn't that nuts, I think? But the problem isn't with success and failure as such, but rather the misplaced zeal and the apportionment of value that comes with that that leads to inappropriate pride. It's almost impossible to escape competition in comparison with others. You might remember John 21, Jesus with Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep, do you love me? Oh, do you only phileo me? Do you only brotherly love? Lord, you know all things. And then Peter says, sees John and says, oh, what about my brother over there? And Jesus said to Peter, what's going on in your head, mate? It's not about him. <laughs> you follow me. <laughs> Don't compare yourself to him. He's got his own deal you will have to work through. You follow me. And everyone is accountable to God for the gap that exists between our actual and our potential. I, I hate the saying or hearing people say of someone, oh, you know, this person has such potential. I want to see people living out the fullness of their humanity, hang their potential. Let's, let's drop that idea. 
Because you see, and, and the words of Rudyard Kipling, I find, really encouraging at this point. He said, we have to treat, look, listen to Rudyard Kipling here, we have to treat those two imposters, success and failure, the same. Our task is to grow past failure and grow beyond past successes. Wow. Isn't that some good wisdom? I love Rudyard Kipling. Because of all Jesus accomplished, we can hit the reset button, set free from both past failures and successes. So for the future, 2021 and beyond, no parking. Come on now, no parking. The significance of Jesus' rescue mission, the reconciliation that, with God that results, our involvement with him, means that Jesus releases us from everything we would want to park by to, that gives us identity, whether it's good or bad. Our failures and infirmities reconciled. Our successes and our accomplishments rescued. Colossians 1.13 in Peterson's paraphrase the message. Cry, I love this bit. love the way how Peterson captures this. That Christ rescues us from dead end alleys and dark dungeons. And my addition is even of our own making. I love the words that Paul pens to the Galatians, and you've heard me speak this out before. I have been crucified with Christ, but I no longer live, but Christ live in me, full stop. And the life I now live in the body, I now live in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. But... I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. So my failures and my successes are neither here nor there. So this means our experience and circumstance, whether positive or negative, they're not events to park by but to learn from and to grow through. We either, remember, we'll either grow better or bitter. We're empowered to orientate ourselves towards real goals, eternal goals, kingdom goals, Jesus goals, to release us to continually be involved with Jesus as he seeks to reach those around us and through us. So Paul's ultimate goal, really three, three very simple goals in Chapter 3 and verse 18 to 14, you can, um, verses 18 to 14, you can check that out. But his riches to gain Christ. His relationship desire to be found in Christ. His eternal reward to participate with Christ in those things that Jesus is seeking to involve us in. So, you know, as we come to this new year, may it be with a resolve not to apologise for those things we don't like about ourselves, our failures, or to bask in the glory of those things that we would consider successes. This coming year, may we all resolve to move on, to embrace metanoia, repentance, as Celia mentioned earlier. It's not a bad word. Metanoia has the idea of transformation. It's like the, the, cat, the, the caterpillar in a cocoon and a chrysalis coming out a butterfly, and everything is mush in the chrysalis. All that's left is the DNA, and out of the chrysalis comes a beautiful butterfly. This coming year, May you resolve to move on, 
to embrace transformation. Try something new. Perhaps take up the idea to be more encouraging and less critical. Remember the things we point at others and say we don't like about them are the things we don't like about ourselves. Let's be thoughtful about that. That we actually say, "Mm, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to look for that which I can encourage. See, I, I love Diane and her work in the office. She only comes in a couple of hours a week. But she's taken it upon herself to dress up my work area and make it fun to be in. Anybody who's been to my work area, you'll see this bird chilling out, and it's a frozen chook in a sink with a beer and a, you know, ah, you know, someone said to the bird, chill out. There it is. That's a pretty chill bird, I'd reckon. I love that about Diane. Always on the lookout for something quirky. I love that about Anne, who comes in and takes things up and initiates new things and, and says, oh, Rich, you missed this spelling word. On, thanks, Anne. I'll check on that next week. No, she's great. I need that feedback, Anne. You're thoughtful about that. I'm not even going to start on you, Shannon. But you see, and Marilyn, oh, we won't even. <laughs> no, I'm not going to talk about you guys, the, the closest that I work with. Oh, I, I reckon I've got the elders quaking in their boots too. No, no, no. But you know what I'm saying. Look for those things that we can affirm, that we can bless into, speak over with kindness and wisdom this year. Maybe intentionally practice hospitality for a neighbour. Celia invited us over for dinner tonight. Unfortunately, we've got some people rolling through our our revolving door this afternoon from Dolby. Didn't know until yesterday afternoon that they were coming. But anyway, but we're going to get there hospitality. Let's extend that to each other. Went out to Ross and June's before Christmas. Great lunch. Whoops, hang on. Let the cat out of the bag there. But, you know, like, let's be hospitable towards each other. Or maybe a neighbour. What a, what a novel thought. Whatever it is, press on. No, 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 no. Don't just do that. What's, what was that word again? Epic tenonymous. Strain forward. Reach forward, focus every intent to be more like Jesus. Remember, no parking. No parking. So to reflect on this morning, as Tony comes to lead us through communion, to reflect on what past difficulty, disability or discouragement do you need to let go of? May may your time with the Lord through the elements, be a release from those things this morning? Is there a past failure that's holding you back? Maybe there could be something quite successful that you say, oh yeah, well I did that really well, I'm going to stay there. You know, if you're going to gain more of Christ and be found in Christ and participate with Christ in 2021, what needs to happen? More of the same, because if you do the same things, you'll get the same outcome. Or something else. And I'd, I'd love to talk with you. Tim would love to talk with you. Gwen would love to talk with you. Tony would love to talk. We'd love to pray with you. We have got a very committed eldership who love to minister the grace of prayer among us. Let's lean in to this gift that God has placed among us that we can press in and press on. No, strain forward. Make every post a winner. I'm going to pray. Tony's going to come and lead us into communion. Father, thank you for the timeliness of this word to us today. A kind word, a word that brings light and life. A timely word to lift us beyond those things that we would park by. Your word to our hearts that we might be more like Jesus. Thank you for these words that you gave to Paul. And Father, we want to commend ourselves to you that we might be those who gain Christ, who are found in Christ and participate with Christ in 20. 21, in the name of Jesus, amen.
Thanks, Reese. May I affirm you in your messages to us. Thank you, brother. They're appreciated. A couple of things before I start. Next, no, a fortnight from today, a baptismal service, 17th of January. So if you're interested in being baptised on that day, come and have a chat to us or to Reese. Marty's birthday next Friday. He's getting a birthday present later this month. A little animal called Barney, a little dog, which he'll be training in terms of um, as a support dog. So we'll hear from Marty more about that when he gets Barney. On the night he was betrayed... Jesus met with his church family, his disciples, the people he'd spent a lot of time with. It was the night of the Passover, so they were gathered together to remember what God had done for his people in the past. Put yourself in that situation. Jesus, leading the gathering giving some instructions to his disciples and going through his head, the haunting of his imminent death, the fear of the imminent physical pain, the knowledge that his disciples are going to reject him very shortly and then going through the disciples' minds. Why? Jesus says, I'm going away. Why? Why? They've got this false belief in their own strengths. No, Jesus, I'm not going to reject you. I'm strong, I can manage it. And then how? Jesus tells them the temple's going to be destroyed, but I'm going to rebuild it in three days. How? What does that mean? And then Jesus says, do this and remember me. Today, you are invited to remember the sacrifice Jesus made for you, for me. We get to share it around the table. We get to take a piece of bread or a cracker and we eat it as a symbol of what Jesus' body, broken for you, what that means for you. And we get to take a cup of juice and hold it And then we'll drink it together and we'll remember his blood spilt for us. A sign of the new covenant of salvation. Of salvation through belief. No matter where you're at today, whether it's profound grief, whether it's confusion... whether you're on a mountaintop or a valley. You're invited to share around this table with us. And I don't know who's going to help me give out. You're going to help collect. Tim and Jackie, can I invite you up to come and and distribute these elements for us, please, with us? Thank you. There's nothing profound about these symbols. But it's the importance that we place on them. Take a piece of bread and in your own time remember Jesus' body broken for you. Take the cup of juice Hold it and let us all share together in this time. While those elements are being distributed, let me read a short passage, which I think follows on from the message Reese has given to us. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. 
Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward to Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus. Today we remember not what we've done, but what Christ has done for us. Let's drink together until he comes. Father, we thank you for this opportunity we can have to share together and remember your sacrifice for us. Lord, help us to never forget it, never take it for granted, and help us always to strive towards the goal that you have set for us, heavenward, in you. As a team comes up and leads us, in our final hymn this morning, don't forget we've got a cup of tea at the back if you want to come and join us in that. Come and have a chat to Reese, Gwen, Tim, myself, someone you trust. If there's other stuff on your heart this morning. And I'll help get Nadine to help us pick up the cups. Thank you.
Thanks so much for joining us this morning and uh, participating in, in this very moving and wonderful time that we've been able to share together in the face of some really difficult stuff that we have to deal with as a community. For our online family, thank you for joining us today. Bless you. And, and on the occasion that there's anything that's unsettling to you, as Tony said, I just want to underscore that invitation of Tony and Tim and Gwen and myself, our, our availability to you, please. Um, if you need to lean into us, we're here to support you. We're here to journey together. And, uh, but we'd welcome you to come and join us for morning tea afterwards. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord turn his face towards you. Give you his peace. Amen. Thank you.